Two high-ranking police officers could face charges for theft. We've got the details coming up. Also, the former Deputy Prime Minister, Peter Turnquist, says he's been vindicated by the court. A mother whose son was shot and killed by police speaks out tonight. Eyewitness News starts now. Good evening, everyone. I'm Janae Noel. Thanks so much for joining us. Topping news tonight, an inspector and an assistant superintendent are now the main suspects in an attempted armed robbery that allegedly took place sometime in March. Eyewitness News has been reliably informed by sources close to the matter that the fate of these two senior officers are now in the hands of the Attorney General's office, where a decision is expected to be made on whether or not they'll face charges. It's alleged that during a routine traffic stop, the inspector and the assistant superintendent reportedly searched the vehicle of a businessman where they reportedly discovered some $90,000 in cash. 
It's alleged that upon finding the funds and taking those funds from the businessmen, they fled the area of the traffic stop. Commissioner of Police Clayton Fernander giving the update on this matter to the media yesterday. We are close to we now have some clarity. Uh, we, the, the detectives uh, in the corruption unit uh, did an excellent follow through, uh, not only uh, communicating with them, but I'm talking about footage would help us with the investigation as well. So we are bringing everything together. The deputy is next to me. Uh, he has full control of that. He, along with his team, and we should be bringing some closure to that very shortly. Meantime, former Deputy Prime Minister Peter Turnquist has cleared of fraud conspiracy claims. A ruling by the Supreme Court determined that businessman Fred Kaiser failed to prove fraud allegations against the former Deputy Prime Minister Peter Turnquist and former Sky Bahamas CEO Randy Butler. The court, however, did determine that Turnquist breached his statutory fiduciary duty and the duty of care of diligence. The ruling Turnquist in a statement says he has emerged victorious against those allegations. Turnquist is an accountant by profession. He served as a manager and director for Alpha Aviation for over a decade. Now, the allegation surfaced back in 2020, prompting the former Deputy Prime Minister and former Finance Minister to resign from the Minister administration amid a global pandemic. The Supreme Court notes that while Turnquist breached his duty to Alpha Aviation Limited, which brought the legal action, the company failed to prove conspiracy to defraud on the part of Turnquist and the other defendants. Turnquist also expressed disappointment with the Supreme Court, concluding that he breached his claim, noting that it was unjust. He, however, asserts that he gave truthful testimony under oath and says he remains committed to serving his community. Meantime, a man wanted for murder and a Jamaican national now in police custody after Police Commissioner Clayton Fernandez says they, along with two other individuals, were arrested by authorities after two illicit firearms were found in their possession. Fernandez considered the arrest a significant so officials have beeped up their presence while vowing to take guns off of the street that continue to wreak havoc on society. We also had a significant arrest over the weekend. Again, we want to commend the operation team, uh, intelligence-led operation, arrested four individuals in a vehicle in a parking lot in our downtown area. Uh, four persons were arrested, one uh, who is a Jamaican national, and they were found in Pazhan gun, uh, nine millimeters, uh, all loaded. Uh, one of the individuals, uh, it's known to us, and there was a flyer, wanted flyer out for him uh, for questioning reference to a number of shootings and uh, even uh, for questioning reference to one or two murders. Uh, so we have the four of them uh, in custody, and the detectives at this venue uh, to talk uh, uh, to them. We'll also bring immigration on board uh, with respect to the Jamaican national. We want to know how we got you how we got here, what he's all about. Well, a jury from the coroner's court returned what a mother describes as a heart-wrenching verdict following the police-involved killing of her juvenile son last year. Linton Ritchie Jr. has reaction in this report tonight. Relinda Johnson, the mother of 17-year-old Elron Johnson, who was shot dead last year by police, is finally breaking her silence. It wasn't a good feeling. A lot of people would say he deserved it, but... The son that I grew up, that I grew up, people would say that I'm a bad mother, I didn't do my job. Elron was the baby. He was my last child. I didn't come on the news when they killed him. I didn't even know they killed my son. And Johnson was shot dead by an off-duty police officer after attempting to flee the scene of an armed robbery back on June 15th, 2023. His mother taking out how she found daughter's son was killed. At 7.30 the next morning, I had to get a call that I had to turn around and find out for myself. My friend called me and she said, Linda, I hear Elron get shoot and he dead. I said, no, Elron didn't get shoot. Elron with his daddy. Then a couple minutes later, like 10 minutes later, my daughter called me and she called me screaming, mommy, Elron dead. I said, no, Elron isn't dead. I hang up on her. 
Then the next daughter called me scream. I called city you back. Another officer answered the phone. His reply was, if you want to know if it's your son, go and find him for yourself, which I feel like it was uncalled for because if y'all shoot my son and y'all killed my son, a, a minor, y'all should at least call me. Before his demise, Elron was being held at the boys' industrial where he was awaiting his court date for a pre previous armed robbery case. Johnson's older girlfriend sang in his bail, his mother having no idea that happened. Negative comments isn't going to hurt me anymore because no one knows how it feels until it hits their doorstep. You understand? And what the court system needs to do, if you have a minor lockup and that parent would not sign that bail, nobody else should be allowed to sign bail for a minor. And the CCTV footage on her son's last words was too much to bear in the courtroom. Mr. Monroe, the, the lawyer of Mr. Moxie, you would never know how I feel. Yes, I walked out of court after hearing my son's last voice. What mother in their right mind could sit down? I know that you didn't bring your son up like that. She says she stands strong in question in the CCTV footage brought before the courts. And the, the video that he's supposed to be shooting at the officer is the only part of the surveillance is what is is what has a glitch. Why? As her son fell victim to peer pressure and sends this strong plea to young men in the country. Pair brush is a serious thing. And I, I, I would tell any, any teen, if someone pressuring you in to do something, find someone to talk to. Because the only thing the gang system doing right now is taking the boys that would never be in trouble and would never knew how handcuffs feel and how the inside of a jail cell feel. And Ron never knew that. Open that at the end of it all, this would bring us some sort of peace and closure. She now fears that the way forward is not a clear one after hearing those two words, not guilty, being read earlier this week in a courtroom. She says that the hole in her heart is growing bigger and bigger after losing her youngest baby boy. Linton Ritchie Jr., Eyewitness News. A women's rights activist tonight are voicing their concerns on the heels of police officials revealing what they say has been an alarming increase in rape offenses. However, what is compounding their concerns is they say authorities seem to be victim blaming. Our Jose Etienne has the details in this report. Seattle Social Services Minister Maxine Seymour is sounding the alarm over the stark increase in reported rapes. Police Commissioner Clayton Fernando revealing this week that there has been an 11% increase in rape over the past year after 61 alleged incidents were reported in 2023. It was quite disheartening to hear that increased. I mean, especially because women are primarily the victims of that heinous act. The upswing in that category of sexual crimes prompting police to offer some advice to women to avoid being potential victims. Fernanda did more harm than good. I'm very concerned that in our country we victim blame. No matter what happens, we seem to manage to place some of the responsibility on the victim, and that is very concerning to me. It's not a woman's fault when she's raped. It doesn't matter if she's raped by someone she knows or someone she doesn't know. A woman is not responsible for a man's act. It's a view that women's rights activist Elisa Wallace shares as well. There are still far too many people telling women and girls what to do and what not to do. It is quite infuriating to hear this from police officers in particular and from the commissioner of police. For officials to continue to try to make our world smaller instead of doing their job to make it a safe place and to ensure that we are free from violence is lazy and insulting and it is a further violation of our rights. It is, it is victim blaming. Wallace argues that the increase in rape crimes could be attributed to government not putting in place legislation that she says she believes could curb this issue. The current administration notably is not just failing to address this issue, but has been unresponsive. It has refused to take action, and its inaction is clear communication on its position when it comes to women and girls and our safety. It has refused to, for example, pass the gender-based violence bill. We have been talking about this for years. That bill has been drafted since 2016, and we have been in communication with the Attorney General's office, with the Department of Gender and Family, and, and we were engaged in consultation on that bill, and all of a sudden it 
was pushed to the back burner, just like the marital rape bill was. And by that, she fears authorities could be sending the wrong message to offenders, which she says could make things worse for this year. When the government is ignoring the need for stronger laws or for laws at all, when it comes to marital rape, for example, and when it is pushing women and girls aside, it is communicating to the country at large and clearly to men and boys that it does not value women and girls. It does not value our safety. It does not recognize our personhood or our, our rights to bodily autonomy or to be free from all forms of violence. It is communicating its commitment to upholding long-held, long-standing harmful gender. As Seymour says, she's of the view that more could be done to curtail the increase as fares mount on if those numbers will continue to increase this year. I do feel that officials are doing what they can. Of course, there are multiple challenges when it comes to crime. Of course, there's the you know, police, there's the court system, there's really victim support. And so when, it, when you look at the comprehensive approach to rape, no, we can definitely do more. Fernando revealed yesterday that 50% of alleged victims know their attackers, while also noting that some incidents have occurred as a result of alleged victims accepting rides from individuals or being in the company of their attacker. We need to do what we can to support women within our society, whether that's making sure that our bus routes sufficiently cover neighborhoods and so that they don't have to walk far to bus stops and from bus stops and maybe be tempted to catch rides because they're tired, they've been working all day and there might be minimal options. We have to make sure that as leaders, that we show that women matter and that women are equal citizens in our commonwealth. Because then if we discount women, then we're telling the ordinary citizen that you can do the same. Jose Etier, Eyewitness News. Well, in court news tonight, a retired police officer is denying all allegations that he pushed Long Island Member of Parliament Adrian Gibson to confess to his alleged crimes and that he told Gibson that he would work something out if he did. Tyler Simonette has been following the case. A retired police investigator denying accusations on the witness stand today that he coerced Sewage Chairman Adrian Gibson into a confession. During cross-examination, Bradley Pratt told the court that those claims that allegedly took took place during a drive back to Gibson's residence in Adastra Gardens did not take place. Gibson's defense attorney, Damian Gomez, charged that during the encounter, which followed a police interview, Pratt told Gibson to, quote, confess because only him will be riding the bus to Fox Hill, end quote. Pratt denied this, repeatedly saying, no, sir, no, sir, no, sir, on the stand. Gomez also questioned Pratt about telling Gibson that he, quote, might be able to work it out for him, end quote, if he confessed, to which Pratt also denied. Back in along with several other investigators trying to investigate Aaron's car rental, a company that allegedly belongs to Adrian Gibson. Gomez questioned the viability of the search warrant that Pratt used to seize vehicles related to Aaron's car rental. Pratt denies that the seizure of the vehicles was illegal. During re-examination, the Director of Public Prosecutions, Cordell Fraser, highlighted the search warrant orders, which, according to court documents, allowed officers to search for electronic devices, cell phones, firearms, among other things. Pratt read the search warrant orders, explaining that it meant anything they can find, they can take, as ordered by the magistrate who signed off on the warrant. Adrian Gibson is currently facing money laundering to his tenure as WSE Executive Chairman. Gibson is on trial with WSE's former general manager, Elwood Donaldson Jr., Joan Knowles, Peaches Farkasen, and Jerome Mizek. Tyler Simonette, Eyewitness News. Well, Abaconians calling for more police presence as crime is spilling over into communities and violence is not an issue they want to deal with as they continue to rebound following Hurricane Dorian. Arlington Ritchie Jr. has more in this report. President of the Abaconians out on crime following the island recording its second homicide this past weekend. Daphne de Graying in, noting that someone somewhere on the island is aware of the cause of violence in Abaco. Well, obviously nobody likes to, um, to have crime in the area and um, definitely on the mainland, nine times out of ten, 
these crimes are happening uh, in communities or amongst um, groups of people where somebody knows what's going on. The first homicide on the island for the year, January 16th, and the second following on April 13th, barely three months apart, which can be alarming for the tight-knit community. Mayolis believing that there's a gap between law enforcement officers and residents. I don't feel there is enough support with the police and the local community. On the mainland, I think that, you know, the police really need the cooperation also of the citizens. We have manpower. Now, on the Keys, there is a different um, situation. They, they do not have adequate police um, presence. Commissioner of Police Clayton Fernander agreeing that more is needed funds are being made to boost officer presence. Uh, we will do just that uh, uh, to boost up additional manpower in, in that area. Following the Hurricane Dorian tragedy, Member of Parliament for Central and South Abaco, John Pinder, saying that the economy is bouncing back. Therefore, the community in Abaco is growing swiftly. Abaco is in a position of, of great economic growth. And with this, we have people from all across the country, all across the world, coming here. With people's influx and of them moving here, there will be an uptick in crime. Mayol is saying that rebuilding the island comes with boundless opportunities, hence the unfamiliar faces that core Abaconians aren't used to. Now, there are a lot of new faces here. Um, there are a lot of don't belong to the community who are coming in to get jobs and construction in particular. And there are faces that, you know, the local residents don't recognize. For an island that is seeing a rapid population growth, it does call for police. I think that the, the, there would be, should be more roadblocks and at different times of the day and when they're not advertised or scheduled just random roadblocks you know in the afternoons early morning checking for persons with you know documents uh checking for weapons i think that we haven't had enough of that pinda says he's working expeditiously with the police force to implement new measures for the island so residents can reclaim their safe community. I, I am constantly uh, uh, looking to boost the police presence here in Abaco. They, they do the best they can with the limited resources that they have. We need a, a the Marine unit to be installed expeditiously so they can get to the Outer Keys. And it would be nice for a, a larger complement to be here in Abaco so that every community feels safe. Linton Ritchie Jr., Eyewitness News. Bahamas splashed international headlines earlier this year. Deputy Prime Minister and Minister of Tourism Chester Cooper hitting back at the larger nations for their scathing review of the Bahamas. Addressing the United Nations, Cooper said travel advisories were issued on the country without context, putting the country's tourism product at risk. I would be remiss not to point out, however, that sustainable tourism for the Bahamas goes beyond on a set of ESG goals. As a destination, we live and breathe by our reputation. Therefore, it is critical to highlight that travel advisories issued by large nations about the Bahamas and other Caribbean destinations have the potential to do incredible harm to our economies and disrupt our sustainability efforts. We believe the release of these advisories without context and portrays a sensational narrative that we must expend scarce resources to correct. The event on tourism at the UN aims to strengthen tourism resilience at the highest level while also maintaining a sustainable agenda. Cooper touted the country's significant success in the tourism industry with millions of visitors coming to our shores last year. However, he laments that financial constraints placed on the Bahamas by global organizations are putting a strain on foreign investment. Notwithstanding, it is important to point out that the existing punishing one-size-fit-all rules and adverse listings from global economic organizations we are not a part of and we had no hand in creating make it all the more difficult to attract the foreign direct investments 
small islands critically need. We seek equity and fairness, and we believe the UN is the appropriate body to set proper standards in this regard. Well, get prepared with an active hurricane season being predicted internationally. Officials at the National Hurricane Center are urging residents not to leave anything to chance. This, as we know all too well, the damage that one storm can bring. Our Chloe Stewart has the details tonight. With the hurricane season less than two months, National Hurricane Center Michael Brennan strongly advised residents to prepare as this hurricane season is expected to be an active one. The message is that you're really at risk every season, regardless of what any seasonal forecast says. It only takes one storm affecting your area to make it a busy year. And given the, the location of the Bahamas, you're uh, at risk the entire hurricane season, all the way from June through November. So it's uh, that preparedness and uh, and and ready has to be there every season regardless of what any seasonal forecast says. But why are the impacts active director at the Bahamas Department of Meteorology explains? Well, the Bahamas is a, a, we are low lying so we don't have the mountains you know like, like other countries may have so what that, that makes us quite vulnerable especially when it comes to storm surge. We have seen the devastation that actually storm surge can do to us because we are so flat, what that allow now is now for the storm surge to go even further inland. So the more powerful these storms are, especially depending on which area they're coming from, we can expect. The has selected the Bahamas as one of the Caribbean countries to be visited by its hurricane reconnaissance aircraft on its annual tour of the region. The hurricane hunters who are part of the U.S. Air Force Reserve use the C-130 aircraft to fly in the eye of the hurricanes, track several storms. So we're able to task up to three storms at a time. So there are 10 of these C-130 aircraft that are available for tasking. We also have two NOAA P-3s from the NOAA Aircraft Operations Center that can also be flying into storms. And we have a Gulfstream jet that can fly high altitude missions around the storm. So uh, depending on where the storms are, we can actually move the aircraft from their home bases in the United States to locations like St. Croix or Puerto Rico or Curacao or Barbados to intercept storms as they're crossing the Atlantic towards the Lesser Antilles. And we can deploy to other places to try to, to they are in the western part of the Atlantic Basin. Now while the hurricane hunters do their investigations in this aircraft, Weather Officer Kay McLaughlin says this is how they collect their data. Uh, we collect uh, high density observations, those are automated. We collect them every 30 seconds and then we send them out to the world in 10, 10 minute packages and you can actually track us that way. And that is um, horizontal data, so it's data from the airplane. And then we also drop dropsons and they're over there and the dropson is, will be released from the airplane and go down to the sea surface and it creates a vertical app profile the atmosphere. Officials are uncertain of specific storm counts as they await for the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration hurricane season forecast to be revealed in May. Chloe Stewart, Eyewitness News. Well, if you've got a news tip or if you've seen news in the making, call the at 397-6397. We also invite you to send your letters to the editor for publication on all of our social media platforms at Eyewitness News Bahamas at gmail.com. And if you're watching on our Facebook or YouTube page, share your thoughts about today's stories in the comments section. We want to hear from you. We are just getting started in Eyewitness News tonight. But when we come back, if you've noticed a bump in gas prices, you're not alone. We've got this update coming up. And later, a solution proposed to help curb sins. We've got more on that right after this break.
Office is brought to you by the best of the best Rake and Scrape Explosion Concert on May 11, 2024 at Breezes Resort. See you there. Welcome back. Here's a look at your Eyewitness News gas tracker. You'll be getting the cheapest tonight at Shell, $5.85. Esso coming in at $5.92. Ruba still the highest tonight, $5.00. And 96 cents. Well, as gas prices inch closer to six dollars, Vice President of the Bahamas Petroleum Retailers Association, Vasco Bastian, telling motorists that the spike in prices at the pump is typical as the summer months approach. We are having a slight increase in, in, in gas prices at the pump. Uh, usually, this happens every business cycle here in this industry after the Easter. You'd find that you know people are getting ready to go into the summer months, and you know the summer months with the anticipation of people traveling, uh, taking road trips, uh, people flying to different destinations around the world, and then added to that with the crisis in in in, in the Middle East, uh, you know we have the still of the war with Russia and Ukraine, and then we also have the war with now with Israel and and Hamas. So all these little variables and all these little external things are contributing uh, significantly to the, the uh, slight increase uh, in gas prices at the pump. Well, Bastian predicts that any future increase won't be as drastic as the gas prices we've seen in the past during the height of inflation. No, I don't think this increase would be significant at all. I think it would be very, very minor. I don't think, I think it's something that we could bear with. We, 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 we've had higher prices uh, before. I know, it's like I always referenced to, to two, three years ago, I think it was in 2021, I think, or 22, somewhere around there, where we had gas was at $7.39. Uh, coming out of the pandemic or a little into the pandemic. So the, the slight adjustment, I think, we should be able to handle uh, from a consumer uh Based, not even I'm not even speaking in my capacity as a as a dealer, but as a consumer, we should be able to handle it. It's minor, it's a couple of cents, uh, and and but we should be able to handle it. 2023 missing persons revealed by the top cop indicate that most who have gone missing are senior citizens. While the president of the Bahamas Alzheimer's Association advocating tonight for a daycare center that she says will assist families to alleviate the burden looking after their loved ones. Our Chloe Stewart has the details in this report. While there is an increase in Alzheimer's and dementia illness with senior citizens in country, President of the Bahamas Alzheimer's Association, Wendy Poitier, is advocating for a daycare facility to assist working families who look after their loved ones. The other things that we also want to try to encourage is the government to um, open the daycare centers because I think that's where a lot of the issues lie. The uh, elderly persons are left home or left unattended because the family members, they have to go to work. Poitier says the daycare facility will alleviate much of the challenges that loved ones face with the disease. But if we had the daycare facilities, the daycare centers, at least that would help ease some of the burden from families that they know that they are uh, elderly or they are, they are a person who has dementia or Alzheimer's, that they are in a secure location. And I think that is that is one of the main things that we need to try to do, see if we can reopen those um, Centers. Commissioner of Police Clayton Fernando disclosed that statistics of missing persons for the year at the police headquarters press briefing on Monday. When you look at the missing person in 2023, we had a total of 311. Uh, we have closed 263 cases. Uh, um, the individuals were found uh, safe. Uh, 48 cases remain open. The stats revealed that most missing persons are senior citizens who suffer from mental illness. Fernanda encouraged family members to keep a close eye on them. Due to mental illness, uh, sometimes miscommunication, uh, maybe loss at sea, some of them are loss at sea. And uh, we want to say to, to family members, and most of them are, are senior citizens, uh, missing persons, 
pay attention to our senior citizens, man. They are the show list that we are standing on today. So you have to be able to pay attention to your loved ones. The Bahamas Alzheimer's Association has partnered with the Crime Watch Group in Stapleton Gardens to register senior citizens with mental illness. Poite appealed to members of the public to partner with police to help ease victims. I to encourage persons to uh, make sure they secure the home um, and to make sure, you know, we know sometimes people, they, they get out, hey, that, that, that's going to happen, but to try as much as possible to secure um, their, their family members and, um, and to secure their, their dwelling places or places where they are. Eyewitness News. For more feedback tonight from residents on that ongoing dispute between the Davis administration and the Grand Bahama relates to millions of dollars being owed. An official from an alternative political party focusing tonight on the monies owed to government and he wants to know why the past and present administration allowed the debt to climb. Jose Etienne has the details. Prime Minister Philip Davis recently revealing that the Grand Bahama Port Authority could face arbitration if they do not pay up a $357 million bill that the GBPA owes for the past five fiscal years. While Assistant Deputy Leader of the Bahama Party, Pastor Glenroy Bethel, says Davis has opened up a can of worms by making that statement. The government of the Bahamas was supposed to, in my words, they should, should be keeping their feet to the fire. But if you're not collecting the money for five years, being a good steward, right? Then, then you, 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 you drop the ball. Bethel insists that based on the laws on the books, government should not have waited this long to be demanding a lump sum of money. But legally, is that the government of the Bahamas would submit their financial statement to the Port Authority. The Port Authority has 30 days to reimburse the government of the Bahamas, $300 million. If you divide that for five years, that's about what, $60 million annually? Well, what happened to the other years prior to? Like Bethel said, what about the years previous to the last five fiscal periods? That would also include a portion of former Prime Minister Hubert Minister's time in office as the country's chief. My government has not had um, issues with the Port Authority. Does that suggest that Minister did not demand funds reportedly owed to government by the authority? While that question remains unanswered, Bethel says Davis's $357 million figure is raising lots of questions. If the Port has tax uh, concessions, taxes, all right, for the most part, for real property tax, We'd like to know what tax did the government receive to say that the port owes them $300 million. Given Bethel's concerns, he's making this demand. If the Port Authority can't pay their taxes and the government can't collect it, we ought not to be paying for VAT down here. And because Freeport really is tax-free to the investors. But we're paying the taxes. And they double dipping. So we have a problem. Now that $357 million debt that Davis spoke of came as a result of an ongoing feud between government and the GBPA. It's an issue that Bethel has an appointment with. We're witnessing a cat fight between the Grand Bahama Port Authority and the government of the Bahamas who represents us. But it doesn't benefit us. None of it benefits us. Jose Etienne, Eyewitness News. Well, the island of Abaco getting a new police headquarters with a price tag of an estimated $10 million. The new facility will be a public-private partnership. This much coming from the Central and South Abaco MP John Pinder on Monday during the unveiling of the model for the new multi-million dollar headquarters. This unveiling comes in the wake of recent homicides taking place on Abaco. The Commissioner of Police, Clayton Fernando, has confirmed that additional manpower will be sent to the island to address what appears to be a growing crime problem. Working on it for more than a year and a half and collaborating with facilities head for the Royal Palmas Police Force to make sure that this isn't a building just put up, but a building that has what is needed 
for them to serve and protect. So as we progress through this, we realize that there were certain things that needed to be entailed. So we identified a, a property, eight acres just south of the airport roundabout, that would not only provide spacing for this building, but provide space for future endeavors, for an expansion for, for generations, uh, in the upcoming generations. TVS headquarters was destroyed by Category 5 Hurricane Dorian back in 2019. All the offices needed, your records office, so you may get police reports right here in Albuquerque, criminal investigation room, six holding cells, one for juveniles, and then others for female and male. It will also have barracks and have accommodations for a limited number of police officers right there on site. The garage space large enough for two ambulances and a space for, for them as well. This is more than just a, a temporary solution. I don't do those. I don't believe MB Cornish does temporary solutions either. We want to do is put something here that we are proud of and something that the future generations of the Royal Bahamas Police Force will be able to utilize to serve. So to come in Eyewitness News, Laurencia Smith just can't stay away from law enforcement apparently. She has a new adventure after this break. But first, here's a check on tonight's weather forecast. This segment of Eyewitness News is brought to you by Lukayan Car Rental. Great rental, great service, and great cars. A live look tonight over Blue Hill Road. The present temperature right around 75 degrees. It's expected to dip to 72. This is Eyewitness News. Welcome back. Our resident adventurer, Laurencia, has officially enlisted as a new recruit, and she takes us on an adventure at the police training college. 
There are only two badges I ever wanted to carry, either a press badge or a police badge. I've always said if I weren't a journalist, I would have become a police officer, as police and have been in my blood for three generations. On this adventure, I got to experience a taste of what recruits go through to get ready for the front line. Recruit Training and Administrator at the Police Training College, Assistant Superintendent of Police, Lakeisha Miller, explains the function of the college within the organization. It is to recruit individuals who are willing and able to be a part of the police force to make it a career. We also do training for officers, regular officers, reserves. According to the force's website, there are approximately 3,000 sworn police officers. Miller says one have to be between the ages of 18 to 30 years old if they're interested in enlisting. A citizen with no criminal history, you have to have at least four BGCSEs. Now the good thing about it is if you don't have that academic qualifications, you exam that we have. It's all also on the BGCSE level. Training lasts about six months and recruits day starts at 4.30 a.m. and ends at 6.30 p.m. Police sciences, you do firearm training, driving training, swimming. Um, you learn different language, Creole, you learn how to drill. Assessments every day. Um, you may break on a Saturday and Sunday morning. Now Miller has been in the uniform for some time and she reflected on her time in training. It's the best part of policing because it's fun memories you, you develop here as a recruit. When you become an officer, all that fun is on, uh, put, put on the side and you become a real-life officer, someone saving lives, making decisions on the spot, life or death decisions. So what are the strong quality one needs to bear the police badge? Um, you have to be committed to this career. If you're not committed, if this is not something you want, you're not going to last. So I, I think integrity, commitment, and loyalty. Now it's the moment of truth. I had to fall in with several police cadets on parade ground where one either run or march. And oh, Sergeant Anderson had no mercy on me. Two, three, three. Down. Stretch. Lisa. I just I move. I to show it. Oh. 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 Jesus. Help me. One thousand. One thousand. Well. As you can see, I definitely would not make it out of training. I'm flat on the ground while the cadets are still in their push-up stance. I think I'm going to stick to reading the news and providing information for the police because I definitely can't help them on the front line. Until next time, Laurentia Smith, Eyewitness News. Man down. Thanks, Laurentia. Well, from the police training college, she is up next with a check on sports. Good evening, Laurentia. Good evening, Jenea. The B3As has officially named the team that will suit up for the gold, black, and aquamarine for the World Relays Bahamas. I'll tell you more on who's on that list straight ahead in sports.
This segment of the news is brought to you by Hennessy, the spirit of sports in the Bahamas. Good evening and welcome to another edition of Eyewitness Sports. I'm Laurencia Smith. Thanks for joining us. Topping sports tonight from the desk of the B3As. Olympic gold medalists Sean A. Miller Weevo and Steven Gardner, Olympians Devin Charlton and Antoinette Strawn are just a few of the athletes named to the 27 member team that is set to represent the country at the World Relays Bahamas 2024. The Olympic qualifying event will be hosted on May 4th and 5th at the refurbished Thomas A. Robinson National Stadium. An estimated 1,400 to compete in the two day event to secure their spot at the Paris Olympic Games. Our sports desk spoke with team leader Dave Charlton, who expressed his confidence in the team that has been assembled. The team, we have some high caliber athletes. Uh, unfortunately, some of our better athletes, uh, uh, mainly the, our college athletes, are not available this year because of um, all obligations to their universities. We are looking to have all of our teams that we are contesting to qualify for the Olympics. And I think this, we can, we can get it done. Um, because of the, 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 the really the relay camp that we put together, the working together, the cohesive of our team, we should be able to qualify all four of our relay teams. Among those joining Charlton in the women's four by 100 meter relay pool are Padria Seymour, Charisma Taylor, and Nia Richardson. Some of the male athletes featured in the men's four by 100 meter relay pool are Samson Colbert, Blake Bartlett, and Carlos Brown. Now joining Speedy Stevie in the men's 4x400 four meter pool are Zion Miller, Alonzo Russell and Wendell Miller. The country has had much success in the mixed relay by 400 meter mixed relay back in 2017. In fact, three out of the four members that won the gold medal will be returning, Miller Weevil, Gardner and Strawn. The executive members have put together this coaching staff. Uh, a lot of experienced coaches. We have Tyrone Burroughs, who's been a member of a number of um, Olympic teams and World Champs teams. Uh, of course, we have the great Pauline Davis, who comes with a wealth of knowledge and experience. We have Ramon Miller, who was a member of the, of the Golden Knights. So we do have a very qualified uh, um, um, uh, cast of coaches. We have uh, Coach Sean Miller, who is uh, the father of uh, Sean A. Miller Weevil. He's been coaching Sean A. He's been doing an excellent job. So our coaching staff is well qualified and they are looking forward to uh, um, the World Relays. Coach Charlton noted that the athletes are expected to be home a week before the relays. Now let's head on over to the softball field. Over the weekend, Reloaded Baseball and Softball recently hosted a fundamental camp for female softball pitchers and catchers over at Baker's Field where they engage two U.S.-based professional softball coaches with the aim to improve deficiencies in the pitcher and catcher positions. Um, I was able to pick on my motivation and my mechanical works with the clock times with my arms and moving and rotating it in the forms that I need to in order to get the ball out and straight ahead. My bounce time, like to get the ball in a second, it was like a little slow. And I've learned like reaction time and like how to settle my mind. I throw in the second, I have to get the ball of my hand in time to make the throw the second. So that was a very good. Meantime, we spoke with Catherine Whaler and Ali McNice, who shared their pride in the skills the young ladies were able to pick up during the camp. We talked a lot about foundational stuff, how the body moves, um, explosion from the body. Um, also, we talked a lot about attitude and the mental aspect of it and just the work that it takes. Through the process, I saw them really with their shoulders rolled back, head held high, really taking advantage of this full opportunity that's in front of them to help their country, their sport, and their team. And I believe that they've left with a little bit more confidence and understanding of what the art of pitching is really about. Well, that's what's making sports at this hour. I'm Laurencia Smith. Thanks for joining us. Stay tuned for more news.
You're watching Eyewitness News. Well, that wraps up news this Tuesday, but, but coming up and beyond the headlines with Shanique Miller. Pitbull dogs on the attack again. Man is here to tell his story. We've got that coming up and beyond the headlines. It starts right after this. That does it for us here at Eyewitness News. It's certainly been a pleasure having you in our company tonight. On behalf of the entire news team, I'm Janae Nawal saying good night. Be safe, everyone.
instances like this one. Good evening to you, Fritz, and good evening to you, Superintendent Carl Capron. It's good to have you both here. Thank you very much for being here to discuss this issue this evening. Good evening, Sinek. Uh, let's start with you, Fritz. Let's talk about, look right there. Yeah. Let's talk about your issue and what happened last Wednesday as you were uh, at, at, at the lady, the, the house Jack, that you Jackie, were, Jackie right, that you were there working yes. in the yard. What happened? Yes, as we approached the yard after we come from getting some water from Echo, we just gone back by the yard. She just gone and she going to go inside after she comes from out the truck. She going to go inside and just get ready for us to go back to the water depot. But as soon as she, she reached Ryan, I was going to the back with two five gallon water jugs in my hand to go fill up for me to go to the, wa the car wash. And as soon as I was going to turn my back, two pit bulls just come rushing from underneath the fence from out of nowhere. I didn't even expect that. Mm -hmm. Didn't even expect that. Did you see the hole that they dug? I yes. mean, dogs have a habit of doing I, I, that. I, I, I look at it afterwards, after it done take place, I, I see how they done dig the hole. There's waiting on me for that moment. Wow. Now, explain what happened. When they attacked you, I mean, the, the photographs that are extremely graphic, yeah. um, and, and it, it, I tell you those wounds are gaping and very, very deep. You had to be, well, the, first of all, describe the attack. The attack was very, very vicious. They bite me on my foot at first. I feel that pain and he get loose. And he's still, as the next one trying, trying to get at my chest, this one, and grab, the next one grabbed my hand. And he just pulling on the sand, pulling on the sand for me to come down low up and to grab my neck. Mm. And I still forced the sand. That's why it's so, so wide and open and mm -hmm. right here. Mm -hmm. I was pulling my hand out remote and all them teeth. All them things, I was pulling my hand out of the mouth. Mm -hmm. At the same time, the next one just jumped up and bite me in my chest. So you have, you have bites on your ch in your chest as yeah, well? Yes, yes, ma'am. Well, of course, we, were you able to make out the images there on the screen a moment ago? And it's are horrifying mm -hmm. yes. uh, to look at. Talk about uh, what, what, um, what did the doctor say? Uh, we see that you are still bandaged, your foot, your, your arm. Um, some of them have been left out to, to heal yeah, naturally. Yeah, no. But they, they say, yeah, come back Saturday and they try to do another little, little test and see what else wrong with me. With the cuts and if they bite in here. Hold, up, hold up your arm so people can see that, they, that this is what, how you came here. And, and you're also using a, 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 a crutches um, to get around. Yeah, I'm using the crutches so because I can't put too much weight on one, one leg. Mm -hmm. where, where he bite on another leg, he, he suck up plenty, plenty of my meat on from another leg. I can't even walk on that too solid. Mm, th that's really just wild. Now, the owner of the dog, the next door neighbor yes. of the house in which you were working as a handyman, uh, have, have they reached out to you? No, 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 ma'am. The owner of the dog, of the dog? Yes. No, they haven't reached out to me. They have not. They have not. They have what do you need them to understand tonight? Because that's a part of the reason you're speaking out, the fact that here you are um, not able to work, not able to earn a living, uh, walking around on crutches, uh, bandaged still, um, and, and obviously traumatized, yes, and tonight. yet they have not reached out. I haven't. I haven't yet. I haven't yet reached out. I traumatized is correct. I can't, you... I can't even see another dog right now looking at them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I want to drop down there if it's so. I can't run. Well, no, you, you can't. You're hobbling about, actually. Um, listen, so how has this affected even your level of, of being able to earn a living? I mean, yeah. you're a handyman. That's what you do. Yes, I'm a handyman. I do construction sometimes, go mm -hmm. on roofs. Yeah, I wash car at times when I'm doing that. I can't really lift a bucket of water. Yeah. Hand, hand is very... I write on that I can't lift a bucket of water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Superintendent uh, Capron, this is th this is nothing new to you. Um, I this gentleman um, really needs to be, I guess, off his rights. The Bahamas Humane Society earlier today pointed me in the direction of an article today in one of the dailies that talked about a kid who was also attacked by a dog and his family, his parents being awarded three thousand dollars. Um, by the courts, uh, the dog owner had to pay that up to the family. Um, but this this often happens too often, and and dog owners in the Bahamas are very very 
careless, aren't they? Definitely. Uh, we, we see a large number of persons that do not take into account the actual human toll that it takes on persons when their dogs are allowed to roam, when their dogs are allowed to escape their enclosures, and some persons just don't even enclose their, their premises and just allow their dogs to roam freely. And you, you may say it's a $3,000 penalty, but someone could have lost their life. Mm -hmm. That child could have potentially lost their life. Mm -hmm. yes. And we have had occasions where that has happened. Mm -hmm. And persons have been placed before the court and face charges of manslaughter. Wow. Simply because they fail to ensure that their dog remains properly secure. There's actually a $500 fine for allowing a dangerous dog to roam freely. And that right there is, is quite lenient, $500. I, mean, I, to I see, agree wholeheartedly. Yeah, to see I the wounds that this gentleman has um, and, and the gaping, just the, the, the gaping holes in his throat all over, that is a slap in the face. What about the instance where the owner may have said, listen, or may be saying, I had my yard fenced in though? Yeah, you, you may have your yard fenced in, but I'm certain that in a lot of these occasions, dogs don't normally just on a one-time basis escape from a yard. Mm -hmm. If you know that your dog tends to dig holes under the fence, then you need to attach a tether to the dog so the dog can't get any further than, than the premises of your, your property. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But when you allow the dog to just freely roam about, a dog is and in, in the dog's mind, he's protecting his premises. That may be what the dog is thinking. Yeah. However, persons on the outside of your yard, a dog can't see a perimeter fence as his territory. What he can see is that somebody not belonging to that premises is intruding on where his family is. So in essence, the dog is doing his job of protecting, of protecting what, his he is, what he feels is his territory. Yeah, we had a moment ago, of course, some pit bulls on the screen. We're not at all suggesting those are the pit bulls in question. But again, uh, this gentleman was attacked, brutally attacked, by two pit bulls as he worked in a yard. We are talking about with just today a kid. Uh, his family was awarded. Um, they were awarded a sum of money by the courts. And now this gentleman here finds himself in, unable to work unable to perform duties, unable to earn a living um, because he was attacked last week as he, as he worked in, uh, in, in someone's yard by the neighbor's pit bulls. And so what does the law say, um, um, Superintendent Capron, um, what does the law say in terms of the rights that people have? Because we see it all the time uh, where dogs dig under fences and, and access another person's yard. I, 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 it's all too common, quite frankly. Shadiq. The law is clear as relates to the Animal Control and Protection Act, where if you allow your dog to roam freely, it's a $250 penalty. But as you said, it, it may not be sufficient of a deterrent, and we continue to see these incidents take place, and we've taken a more aggressive approach in terms of when these matters of, of persons are actually being attacked. We actually charged persons before the court mm -hmm. with causing harm, with negligently causing dangerous harm. Persons are facing criminal charges when they negligently allow persons to be bitten by their dogs. And I know that, that we may hamper on, on the pit bull, but the majority of, anim, of dog attacks are pot cakes. You bet right. Are the they're, Bahamian pot cakes. they're just as vicious. And we don't, I don't think uh, people take the pot cake as serious as they should. We see it as our little friendly neighborhood pot cake, mm -hmm. and we allow him to just run freely around the yard, no collar, no identification, unlicensed, and these dogs go out and attack people. And the, the, the biggest threat that we have is when you have dogs in a pack. Yes. And that pack drive takes over, and we have incidents such as this. And, and it's unfortunate that persons are not taking the accountability to ensure that their dogs are properly secure. Mm -hmm. And we will step up our rigorous enforcement to ensure that, that the laws, the animal control laws, are being adhered to. Because too many people are not obeying the laws as relates to ensuring that their animals are properly secure. And if you cannot control your animal, then you do not need to have it.
especially with these attack dogs that are that are more aggressive um, is there a special permit or license that one must have there's not a special permit for a, a, a regular dog there's there's different fees as it relates to having a guard dog premises or a guard dog facility but not in terms of having a dog at your yard however you have to note that if your dog is deemed a dangerous dog then we, we have a tendency to be able to, to take your dog, to seize the dog and have the dog either destroyed or, or seized by the government. Mm. Fritz, what do you, what's your next move? You, you head back to the hospital when, or to the sad, doctor when? Sad, sad, sad that they, they came back over to see how, how good it getting. They get stitched up. I think they still get some more stitches they got to put in my hand because they're still swollen. They didn't want to do no stitching, they do no stitching, but I know. I know. What it could be after that. What appeal do you want to make to this homeowner um, who owns the the pit bulls, but have, but have yet to reach out to you? And she, I know, I know what 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 what, what she coming with. I can't say, I can't say. I know she fortunate enough, so I know. I only could lead the job. Sure. Uh, superintendent, I mean, should that even be his concern, whether she's fortunate enough or not, to step in and help him with his medical expenses? I mean, I, I don't want to get into the, the, the civil aspect of it, but uh, legally, from, from a law enforcement aspect, mm -hmm. we cannot allow persons to continue to behave in this, in this fashion, to allow their dogs to just escape their yard and attack persons. It's, it's fortunate that they, their injuries, even though they may be grievous, the injuries that he has were not worse. Yes. And he described earlier for me uh, the encounter, and I, 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 don't, I don't know what to say. For instance, if you know that these things happen and you see the, the toll that it takes on, on persons, a gentleman that, uh, that is working with his hands, a handyman, and I mean, we need to encourage persons to please ensure your dogs are properly secured. This, in many, many occasions, it could be persons' lives that we are talking about. That persons' lives. We've had so incidents where the dogs have killed have people. Been lines, but if I had fall down and let them grab my neck, that could have been my life right there. Yeah, we, we must take much more accountability. That keeps playing through your mind, uh, if you had fallen down and, and they would have grabbed your neck. I can't sleep. It hates me so much, I can't even sleep. That's understandable. That's understandable. I, Fritz, I thank you for coming and even recounting it this evening. Yes, um, very concerned friends of yours are reached out to be on the headlines and wanted this out because they yes. want you to get the help that you need from the person or persons responsible. I thank you very much, Superintendent Capron from the police, Royal Bahamas Police Forces K-9 unit for sharing with us about what the law is and what, the, what Fritz and anybody else's rights are um, as it relates to this and being attacked by dogs and especially attack dogs, you know, any dog in fact. And so thank you. Two, 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 absolutely, two pit bulls. Thank you, thank you both very, very much. And, and, and I'm very happy that, that you were here, Fritz, yes. that you are here to even talk about it. I'm glad I could talk about it. I'm glad I get to talk about it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, this is Beyond the Headlines. We are back right after this. Cancer Treatment Centers of America is now City of Hope.
segment of Beyond the Headlines is brought to you by the best of the best Rake and Scrape Explosion Concert at Breezes Resort on May 11, 2024. See you there. Welcome back to Beyond the Headlines. Outspoken former member of parliament Frederick McAlpine is speaking out on the government and the Grand Bahama Port Authority standoff tonight. McAlpine spoke to the issue with the media and tonight he joins me to further explain his position on the Grand Bahama Port Authority and how it's found itself now cornered. Good evening to you, Mr. McElpine. Thank you very much for joining me here on Beyond the Headlines. It's good to see you. Thank you, Shanique. It's a pleasure to you. And good night, Mr. McElpine. Before I go any further, please, Shanique, allow me the opportunity to give my, what I should say, sympathy towards that young man, very compassionate about his plight, and I do hope that he would find justice and that he would be compensated that which he's been going. Yes, I, I agree with you, and I, I hope he is as well. Um, um, it, to see the, the injuries that he has, and I'm sure it's a long road of recovery ahead of him, but it's really quite frightening, his ordeal. I want to get to you, though. You, you're never short of good that you began your words there, but the words that you are using uh, towards the government you said the government must be broke or desperate and that it's unfair for the Port Authority to be backed into this corner by the government. Uh, please to elaborate right there. Well, to ask the Grand Bahama Port Authority to give you $357 million within approximately almost another 15 days to go before uh, the deadline is asking much of the people of Grand Bahama. Uh, I've said that one of those persons have indicated we're not always happy with the Port Authority, this present Port Authority, which seems to, in many instances, we've had our falling out as a community. We felt that Port Authority could have done more than it has been doing uh, in the past, but we also confess that in the last two or three years, they have up their game and they have been doing the best they can. The government should now be asking for $357 million uh, during this period. It leads one to wonder why. Uh, why are you asking for this money? Uh, this money has not been asked for by any other government. And uh, when you ask the Port Authority to give you $357 million, in order for them to give you that money, and that will cost the vote, it means that you're putting more taxation on us, the people they have to report. Because we're going to be the ones who are going to have to help cough up this money or get this money uh, in order for it to be paid to the government. The question is why. So you Other feel you feel as though this really isn't even so much about the Port Authority because the Port Authority will obviously pass that expense and this, this demand on to the people and the business owners and the residents of Freeport. At the end of the day, that's what's going to happen. That's the way any business is, is carried on. If the government is charging them, they're going to have to turn around and charge the people. And that's just not fair for a government who said that they're concerned and they're caring about the people. And the question is why now? And the reason why I said it, it appears to be a shakedown is because, like I said, I know more than I'm off to say, and I'm not going to say at this time. But uh, remember now, the government themselves indicated, and I don't think this is their position today, that they want the court because I think we've made it clear that we do not wish to have the government involved when it comes to our garbage. And, and uh, we just don't feel that the government is capable of doing that or handling that or managing that. Well, we'll get and to that in a moment, how you feel the government is incapable. But you said, why now? The prime minister says, why not now? Because this has been allowed to slide for too long. And he is the one to hold the Port Authority accountable. No, he says, why not? <clears throat> I'm not going to tell you, but he knows why not now, because, uh, you see, sometimes when you cannot have your way, then you resort to other things. And that's why I said it's like a shakedown. Remember, I just want to remind the country, uh, I don't believe it is the case now, and I said this earlier, it was the government who said that they were interested in the Port Authority. Mm -hmm. Now, let us all remember now, this $355 million that's owed to them, uh, that the government says owed to them, uh, was never mentioned prior, before, when the government, before the government had interest for the authority. So 
you feel so this is all building the case towards that and the Port Authority cannot back its way out of this corner in about two weeks? I, I know that first of all, you have to remember that, that the Port Authority, the Land Norma Port Authority, said that they do not owe this money. They have said that, yes. The government <laughs> given up an itemized listing as to how they came about owing this money. All we learned is that Pricewaterhouse uh, was the accountant that did the paperwork. But where is the listing for this money? Where, 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 how is it that the government, why hasn't the government explained clearly and precisely to the people of Freeport and the licensees of Freeport and the Bahamas as to how this money is owed to them? Now, another owed, thing, another very strong argument that the government raised is that the Port Authority has failed to live up to its, its, its part of the deal in the Hawk, Hawksbill Creek Agreement and that Freeport is a rundown city, uh, a shell of what it used to be, and, and, and there's no work and no real effort going into improving, maintaining, and upgrading the infrastructure, and also attracting new activity and new energy there. How do you respond to that? Has the Port Authority failed the people of Freeport, in your opinion, or not? There were times, in comparison to what we were used to under the late Edward George, to Jack Hayward and to Albert Miller, comparing that Grand Bahama Port Authority to this Grand Bahama Port Authority is like night and day. But yes, let me go a little further and say that they said that the Grand Bahama Port Authority has not lived up to their agreement. And I can hear that. But you can't expect, let me put it this way, you can't accept some agreement and ignore other parts of the Hawksville Creek Agreement. And so I think the government is being complicit uh, with that charge that they're placing at the feet. But if I can tell you some things, for instance, that I don't agree with that's in the Hawksville Creek Agreement that gives the um, Grand Mama Port Authority some power to do some things. And so um, you, 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 you're picking at one piece of the Hawksville Creek Agreement, but there are other parts of the Hawksville, Hawksville Creek Agreement mm -hmm. that you have conveniently sought to ignore. Yes. Now, I want to ask you, why are you speaking out now? Why didn't you speak out at uh, when this uh, sort of ultimatum or this, this, this demand to pay up was first uh, issued? Well, I don't know. I've always been an advocate to speak against the court when I think they were unfair to the Bahama. I'm speaking now because, one, I know more than I'm saying, and the facts are in my purview. And this is my island. I live here. I grew up here. Uh, Free Pride has always been a part of me. And so this is my home, and I want the best. Well, I admit, I've admitted that, yes, the Grand Bahama Court Authority has done bad in some situations, in some circumstances, mm -hmm. but I'm not going to get bad for worse. <laughs> the, the court, so even if we even if we come to Grand Bahama Court Authority is bad, I say the government of the Bahamas taking over uh, the management of the Freeport City would be far worse. Is there rumblings already among business owners and investors? Uh, recently, Grand Bahama Port Authority talked about a $2.5 billion dollar uh, set up investments that are in the pipeline, and some of which are already in motion. Is is there some sort of response? Are they paying very close attention to this and how it plays out? Yes, because it, it then puts in jeopardy investments and investors. You know, we, we don't want to, 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 to muddy the water. And I, I, I don't believe that the, 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 the well, the government, the first of a hostile takeover is in purview of those who are watching on the international scene. Now, I don't want to lay this at this, but then when people look at the progressive liberal party governance, they always seem to be in some triangle or acquiescing to something negative as it relates to investors. Let us not forget Bahama. Let us not forget Bahama. The PLP government is back in again, and now we're having a dispute with the Grand Bahama Port Authority. So even if you want to say they have the claim when it comes to Bahamas, they acquiesce to that behavior of being over from the original.
original visionary. So that mm-hmm. is what they think. That is the perception. Now we come back again, and you have the Port Authority. So people invest in this international thing. Hmm. Bahama. So today, the Grand Bahama Port Authority will be tomorrow. Albany, in Latin, uh, the crew, the mm-hmm. Carnival Cruise, the Grand Bahama Shipyard. When does it start? And it always stays under the PLP code. You have to be able to recognize that, even if it's not the case, perception, mm-hmm. not a good look internationally. And it does not come off as if we are investor friendly as a nation. Also, oh, that's the, that you feel as though that's the look it's giving already. How does this need it, to play out in order for all sides to walk away happy? in your opinion? I think what we've been asking for, which is that the government and get to the table of communication, not one side giving demands and talking and bullying, communicating, talking to each other and not at each other. Mm-hmm. Communication, compromise. There has to be a compromise. In marriages, there are compromise. In relationships, there are compromise. There needs to be a compromise. And then there needs to be a commitment to the people of Freeport, Grand Bahama. Yes. This is about the people of Grand Bahama. And this commitment will result in what I would say the Bahamas benefiting. Don't forget now, Freeport proper, under the auspices of the Grand Bahama Port Authority, gives approximately in taxes, pays in taxes approximately two hundred million dollars. Annually. Time that they're thinking this money is owed. That would have been a billion dollars plus mm-hmm. that we would have to the treasury, the Freeport area. Well, that that's a substantial amount that you just that mentioned. Has to do with West Grand Bahama and East Grand Bahama. That's just the Freeport area problem. Yes. Uh, so, um, Yes, sir. Yes, Reverend, uh, Reverend McElpine, I thank you very much for joining us. I want to give you an opportunity for a wrap-up comment as we wrap up this segment. Um, and, of course, you and, like many others, you're not the only person that's voicing sort of sentiment uh, in regards to what's happening. So I'll give you an opportunity for a final comment. My final comment will be this. It ought to be about Bahamas, the management of the Bahamas, at the same time, it should be about the people of Grand Bahama. If we're putting $200 million back into the corpus of the Bahamas during our hard economic time, we're saying how much of that money is coming back to us to be spent on us during our hard time. This is about the Port Authority and the government growing up and being mature adults, be adults, get to the table, work it out. Well, this matter certainly is of the rest of the nation. We are watching. As I said, it's roughly about 15 days until uh, we, we see if Grand Bahama Port Authority puts up or what. And so we will continue to obviously track this matter. Uh, thank you very much, Reverend Frederick McElpine in Freeport, Grand Bahama this evening. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Don't go anywhere because when we come back, we're going to shift gears and lighten things up a bit as we talk about what's happening, a very special event talking about, hey, it's all about the women. What's, what about the men? Well, Bahamas Harvest is here, and the lead pastors, Pastor Mario Moxie, Pastor Hervis Bain are here, and they're going to talk about a men's march that's happening, uh, coming up. We are backward after this. <laughs>
This segment has been brought to you by CBS. <laughs> Welcome back to Beyond the Headlines. We are going to, as I said, shift gears. Wonderful event geared toward the men in this nation to bring them together. It is called the Men's Mobilization March. And it is really being spearheaded, even though they told me not quite Shanique, but it's being spearheaded by Bahamas Harvest to Pastor Mario Moxie and Pastor Herbis Bain. Good evening to both of you, gentlemen. Good evening, good Shanique. Evening. Shanique, Shanique. So good to be with you again. Yes, I yeah. love the energy. I, I, you see, I need it with my voice. Jump right in. Um, at a time when men are under threat yeah. in this nation, we see just from the weekend to yesterday how, how severely they are under threat uh, with uh, just this homicides and, and so much. Um, let's just talk about this mobilization march and what it's intended to do. Well, the Men's Mobilization March is all about gathering men from the length and breadth of this nation. And every man in this reality you're in, we want you to march. There are teams in every family island that are meeting and they have their plans. And so if you're in the family island, we're all going to And And Shanique, I got to tell you this, this is not a Bahamas Harvest Church event. Mm -hmm. This is a, an event where uh, most people probably already know the history of uh, Pastor Vaughn Miller, who's now a cabinet minister, minister of environment. He and I have a, a long-standing history of, of working together. And uh, so we hear about this as Says, you know, we have to do something with our nation. We have to do something with the men in our mm -hmm. nation. Mm -hmm. So we got together some friends, and uh, part of this directorate that we have include uh, Hervis Bain. Well, let me let me be uh, let me make sure I use the right titles because in our directorate, we things we want to communicate is that we're all brothers. Right. So there, we we put our titles at the door. So as, as brother Hervis Bain, mm -hmm. brother Vaughn Miller, uh, brother Shannon Don Cartwright. Uh, Brother Valentino Williams, Brother Hewlett and Hannah, Brother Franklin Butler, and Brother Jack Thompson. Uh, we make of the direct. It's a mixed group of men of different walks of life, different callings on their life. Uh, but we all share the same passion and the same desire, and that is a better Bahamas. We want a Bahamas uh, that, that's representative of the Bahamas that we all know we can be. Mm -hmm. uh, when we leave this place, we want to leave something here for our children's children. When we look around, as you said, just this past weekend alone, there must have been about uh, four murders over the weekend. Mm -hmm. That's a tragedy. We are in a national crisis uh, where there's an, an, an violence in this country, and it, we need to bring it to the forefront. We need to talk about it. And that's why this march is so important, because it takes the spotlight, it shines it on this one area, and, and, and for the men can come together in unity and solidarity uh, with one voice. This is not just a march. This is a move of men speaking and shouting uh, with their feet marching on the ground saying this is the Bahamas to live for or die for. Well, that's pretty interesting and very necessary. How do you plan to sort of bring the man out um, um, in and, and droves as is necessary when men complain of not being involved and included However, they oftentimes want to stand on the sidelines. I guess, Pastor Bain, you can jump. Um, to be honest with you, Shanique, the aspect of it all is, is that we're asking the men to take charge by just, yes, they might want to stay on the sidelines, but Shanique, this is an opportunity for uh, all men to silence that and silence that by saying, listen, I'm going to show up. I'm going to show up at Clifford Park three o'clock on Sunday, the April the 28th, and I'm going to be a part of this march, and I'm going to let my feet speak for me as I march in solidarity with my brother. Um, we're asking all men to wear white. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not, I didn't put on white just because, yeah, but I'm saying. Yes, yes, yes. And right, so, and then it's <laughs> also. Like, you take my jacket off. <laughs> no, no, you look, you look nice. You look nice yeah. and you're close to white. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, so. It is like a, a blank canvas to say that yes. anything can a fresh happen. Start. A fresh start. Yeah. You know, and yeah. so wear your white shirts with some jeans, some um, casual um, pants or casual um, shoes, and we're asking the men to come together. Okay, 
remove that stigma of saying, oh, men don't, can't come together, remove that stigma of men wouldn't do anything, yeah. and show up on April the 28th and let us march in such a way that, you know, that brother on the side of you can be that next door opener for you. Yes. That brother on, in the back of you can be that one pushing you forward. So you never know what can happen uh, in regards to coming together, joining together, and building community together. It's, it's free. You don't have a cost to it. You don't have to register. The only thing that you have to do is show up. And mm -hmm. when you show up, I guarantee you, we will show out. Now that's amazing. Oh, I'm happy to hear, first of all, it's a movement, not a one-time event. And so obviously it's going to continue and, 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 and be, uh, I guess, show up in various ways as we move forward. Uh, now, this event on the 28th will be happening simultaneously around the nation, yes? Yes. How, what is the message, though, to get men to realize their rightful roles, their places, in their families, in their communities, and, and the fact that they can begin thinking again as the leaders they are supposed to be? You know, we don't have to do much. The men are watching what's going on, and we are the natural leaders of families, and every man has a stake in this country. And we see what's happening around us. We are our brother's keeper, for real, for true. And, and what that means is, is that we take care in, and take pride in what we see. So it's very important for us, uh, and, and this is a message that we don't have to really do that much pushing. Yeah. Every man wants to move <laughs> forward in his life. And it doesn't matter what age he is at. I, I've had the privilege of speaking to older men, young man and it's the same passion we want to make our mark in this nation we want to move forward but what we're asking men to do is not just move forward but to bring someone else along with you yeah. so when you come out on the 28th just don't come by yourself bring another brother with you uh, that you can bring up this is all about us locking arms of faith together uh, with one voice with one purpose uh, there are no big eyes and small U's, and that's why we're stripping all titles yes. uh, on that day. Uh, we're going to have a rally, uh, and, uh, and then the rally is going to be followed by a candlelight vigil. And this candlelight vigil is going to be done in memory of those who have fallen, all our brothers who have fallen, especially to violence. We want to remember them. Uh, we, we, um, the and a, a, that we have and we sense within all of us. We hurt when our brothers hurt. Uh, there was a gentleman who lost his life this weekend that is very close to, to us in our, in our family, in our church family, uh, because of the work that he was doing uh, on our new church facility. So, so we all feel this in one way or the other. We're all touched uh, in one way or the other. And so it's important for us as brothers to come together. And so, no, that there's a purpose that we have as men uh, of, of our family, be the prophet, priest, and king to, to direct, protect, and correct, to guide God and govern those who are in our care. And this is something that is innate in every single man. And that's why men are rising up in this nation. And you're going to hear our voices and see us in living color in our white shirts on the 28th of April. Rising up is good that they're realizing their rightful roles and places. Because the men that you all speak of and those that you hope to attract, they need to drown out the voices and the actions of those who are just very few, but who are so loud in, in how they are ruining the look of men in the Bahamas. And one of the great things, you know, I'll share these two things with you. Just a couple of weeks ago, I saw a young man walking out of the store uh, right close to the same shopping center where our church is at, and he had his children with him. Uh, these are small children, a uh, three-year-old, a four-year-old, and he had an infant in his, a, a, a grown infant in his arms, and, and he's carrying this diaper. Mm -hmm. and, and I looked at him and said, you know, this is a picture of what a man is all about. He's caring for his children. And the other aspect is we have a speech competition right. where our junior high and senior mm -hmm. high students will speak. And it, it is not of, of words. It, it's, it's a platform where they will be able to proclaim purpose and passion and, and their perspective on the issues in our nation. So the speech competition is going to be at a very exciting time mm -hmm. for us to hear from our youth. See, everyone has a stake here, not just the older men, but also the younger men like myself. <laughs> I, I, oh, that's so awesome. I like yes. that. What is the impact, gentlemen, that you want each man to walk away from Clifford Park with until the next event? 
Well, it's like Brother Mario said that it's a movement. And it's a movement being that if you are inspired, that if it's in your community and you have an influence in your community, you can do something um, coming off of this march. If you are just basically a strong um, individual within your family, you can bring all of your nephews, your, your, your cousins, um, or you being an uncle, you being a father, bring them all together and have that robust conversation with them to understand, like, listen, we have to take a stand. We have to basically be that man that God has required us to be. Um, here's an opportunity for us to have a general conversation. A f an individual asks the question, you should not be intimidated or you sh should not hesitate yeah. to answer that question as a man. I, and not in a derogatory sense, but just simply opening up your heart and bearing these are my feelings and these are my feelings as men. Because you know, sometimes we are accused as men that we don't talk. Mm -hmm. And so when we begin to talk, um, people will listen. And so don't be afraid to learn the ways of a better way. Why? Hopefully from this march, hope can now um, take yes. its rightful place. Mm -hmm. yes. Hopefully from this march, a sense of confidence can now be the backbone to most men. Hopefully from this march, we can walk away with a inspiration to say, I will do my endeavor best to march on Bahamaland. Yes. Mm -hmm. It's really important to every, every woman, I imagine, wife, daughter, fiance, girlfriend, uh, standing behind the men of this nation and want them all to be there. Because when men lead and take their rightful places, uh, we certainly have a better society for it. So yes. I'm going to protect um, Brother Mario by saying it's all right for the support of the women oh, okay. to be uh, at this march, but they will be at the sidelines cheering us on. Wearing white still. Uh, well, well, they can wear white mm -hmm. and they can clap us up, you know. So I I'll take the heat from the women who, who give me the side eye, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. yes. And allow for the men to feel like, okay, brothers, we can stand together, but yet still not forgetting the support that the women bring yes. to us. And so we're asking you to cheer us on. We're asking you to be a part uh, of it by just making sure that, you know, wake that person up and say, hey, it's 3 o'clock, aren't you? You don't have to do much urging <laughs> because women all over this nation are saying tonight, yeah. clapping you up because, because women generally want the men to get out, get out there out front and lead yes. and be strong, yes. you know, and equipped uh, to, to just to be the leaders that they should be and they were born to be. I thank you, gentlemen. Let's just talk quickly about the 28th again, what time and where. It's going to be at Clifford Park. We start at Clifford Park and we end at Clifford Park with a rally and a prayer vigil, a candlelight prayer vigil. And uh, this is a call, a clarion call for every man in the Bahamas regardless of your age, regardless whether you're a young man or an old man, regardless of your hue, whether you're light-skinned, regardless of your religious background, we want every man to come out and participate. Be part of the history of our country. Register your voice. Register your, your feet on this special occasion. Excellent, excellent. Again, that's the 28th of this month. That's a Sunday time. 3 o'clock, 3 p.m. Uh, excellent time of the day. Go out there with your family and be there to make a difference, to yes. begin steering this nation as it, in terms of its men in a whole different direction yes. that's more desirable. Amen. I thank Mario and Hervis. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank yes, you. absolutely. Sister Shanique. Uh, well, right. Sister Shanique. Listen, <laughs> support the men. Yes, absolutely. Thank you very much. I Amen. thank you. And I want to thank all of you for tuning in this evening. We certainly enjoyed having you along, and we look forward to seeing you right back here tomorrow evening. For the entire Beyond the Headlines, Shanique Miller, make it a great evening, everyone.